one by one, the parts add up like links in a chain, each link making possible the next. The ideas that go into diesels are linked together like the parts, across a vast assembly line that reaches out of the past into the future. Well, we're research engineers, and our job is to find the next link in the chain of progress that each year increases the usefulness of all the knowledge and skills that gather in a diesel. way to tomorrow one little step at a time, one thousandth of an inch, one ten thousand. Then once in a while we take one last step. Maybe we change the wearing surface of a piston ring and rounding a bend we come face to face with a new opportunity. A new opportunity and a program to take advantage of it are why we're meeting today. It's a program close to all of us though we come from different divisions of the company. The executive service manager is here because the program touches the performance of every diesel in the field. The vice president in charge of sales is here because it affects the useful life of every engine he sells. Because it involves the future of the entire diesel industry, the executive engineer is deeply concerned, and so is the vice president in charge of engineering. Though the program is a big one, it has to do with little things. A piece of hose, an oil filler cap, a filter. We call it Operation Hourglass, because like an hourglass, it's about time and fine sand or dust. Operation Hourglass began on a battlefield. Flashing sand and dust of North Africa, the American army pressing towards Tunis was locked with a cracked Nazi Africa Corps in a war of vast distances that could only be fought with machines. During the first fateful winter of the campaign, the machines often broke down, leaving brave men defenseless at the mercy of the enemy. As the battle continued, the problem of breakdowns became a matter of victory or defeat, of life and death. As the winter weeks passed, maintenance men in the field worked night and day. They found the engines filled with dust, which in a few hours had worn the engine parts to the point where they had to be replaced or reground. campaign continued and winter turned to spring, engineers back in the States focused their efforts on the problem and rushed to the front new engines, better protected against dust, which allowed American tanks to outlast the enemies. Today, the grandsons of the air cleaners of Africa guard the diesels that roll across the land across the world. Most people take for granted the air cleaners must be working all right. After all, look what power the diesels give day in and day out building a nation's dams and roads. Of course, everyone knows dirt's bad for all internal combustion engines. But most people take the attitude that the diesels can take their share of dust and never know the difference. That's the way people can take theirs. 
least that was the way most operators looked at the dust around their diesels until a few years ago. A few years ago, we visited an old customer. He had recently bought an engine which had quickly shown excessive wear. He demanded an explanation. Well, it only took us a few minutes to see that dust getting into the engine was the reason for the trouble. But try as we would, we could point to no proof that made sense to the customer. Although he had known in a general way what dust does to internal combustion engines, we couldn't convince him it had caused excessive wear in his own engine. As we started homewards, we were disturbed. You see, our job is not just making engines. It's helping our customers get the most out of them. We hadn't been able to make a problem clear to a customer, so we hadn't helped him. And as we thought about this, something crossed our path that seemed to give the old problem of dust a new urgency. There. We saw dust enter an airplane engine, which had no filter to protect it. Through the open air intakes, the dust had been sucked right into the cylinders. safely home, but the life of the engine was shortened, though no one would know it until much later. If even a plane engine suffers, how about the engines down there that work in the dust every day? How well was dust kept out of them? How many engines, gasoline and diesel alike, were being needlessly damaged because their owners didn't fully appreciate the effects of dust? We had an obligation to our customers, indeed to every man who owned a diesel, to make a thorough, conclusive study of dust and what it does to power. by a supercharger, or today by a modern turbocharger. More air, but air means dust, dust from Indiana, dust from Texas, from Maine and California. More air means more dust. Almost every engine has an air filter. But no filter is 100% efficient. Some dust gets through and enters the engine and rubs against its surfaces. Dust means wear, and more dust in the same space means more wear. But how much wear did dust cause? And how could we make it less and keep the dust out better and have more power without still more wear? Back at our research building, we began to answer these questions and others. It was, in a sense, like a game of 20 questions. To win, we had to ask the questions in the right order. 
Our first question was, what sort of dirt and how much gets through the air cleaner of a diesel? To answer the question, we had to trap some of the dust. For the first test, we used an oil filter bag sewn up at one end, keeping the test very simple, so it could be easily carried out across the country. Inside the connection, the bag would act like a windsock, refiltering the air that passed through the cleaner when the truck was on the road. Later, we were to perform scientifically controlled tests in filter efficiency. But our purpose now was simply to collect the dust that actually enters engines. In our research department, as the month passed, we examined many different samples against a clean background of facts and figures. Dust samples were taken from diesels in every kind of truck and shovel and scraper and tested for abrasiveness. Because we know that what would cut glass would always cut steel, we used glass for the tests. To simulate the conditions inside an engine, we mixed the dust with oil. In almost every case, after we rubbed it a few times, the dust cut glass. How much more would it cut the constantly moving parts of an engine? To find out how much wear dust caused in diesel engines, we used a special uniform test dust, which represented a cross-section of the dust from the field. We measured off small doses into envelopes, with which we would perform a series of controlled experiments. Downstairs in our research building, where we put experimental engines through their paces, were several standard engines of the kind our customers buy every day. We wanted to find out how various amounts of dust affected these engines under various loads and speeds and temperature conditions and using various kinds of engine parts. And there was only one way to do it, to destroy the engines. How soon would the engines begin to show signs of the mistreatment we were putting them to? We decided to run the engines for 50 hours before opening them up for the first time. The pattern of wear we began to see existed at this moment in every diesel in the field which dust was entering. We were recording every possible aspect of this wear and controlling scientifically every circumstance that might affect it. As the hours passed and we emptied one packet after another into the engines, we were amassing a body of facts from which we would be able to draw conclusions that would be beyond doubt. Long before they were completed, the dirt tests seemed to be leading to conclusions of real value to our customers. But the goal of all the work we do daily in our research department is not what seems to be, but what is. We had to be patient and wait until every possibility had been investigated and all the facts were in.
after 150 hours when we tore down the engines for the third time, we saw something which could not be produced except by putting dust into engines. It was a pattern of wear which we had never been able to produce by mistreating engines in any other way. The closer we looked, the more we realized that now we had the facts. And how. We had proved that a surprisingly small amount of dust would ruin any diesel. And here it was, a mere eight ounces, a mere cupful. With this much dust, we had worn out completely even the best materials which had ever been developed by any engine manufacturer. We had found dust caused a specific pattern of wear on the surface of piston rings. The queer thing was that this pattern was the typical pattern found in the field, even when no one had noticed a dust condition. The wear on the piston ring on the right, worn out in the test cell, showed the same pattern as the ring in the center from a typical scraper, and the ring on the left from a highway truck. How much each had worn depended not on how many hours the engine had run, but on how much dust had entered it. In this fact, we began to see an opportunity to help every diesel owner get more life out of his engines, perhaps even double their value, just by keeping out dust. But keeping it out, how? We'd wanted to keep it out by pressurizing crankcases and by helping develop new filters that were almost 100% efficient instead of 98% or so. But it wasn't a matter of a few percent. The dirt was pouring in. Across the land, it was the fate of diesels constantly to work in dirty surroundings. In shops and garages from Maine to California, something had to be done to put diesel owners and mechanics constantly on their guard. Would it be hard to change the old-fashioned ways which too often took dirt for granted? To find out, we sent servicemen from our dealerships across the nation to investigate the details of maintenance. They found that too often the openings an engine has for its fuel and oil and air were left open, inviting dirt in. Often the dirt was literally poured in out of dirty containers with the fuel and the oil. Often air hoses rubbing against metal were badly worn no one noticed the cracks which had formed. It was the same all over the country. It was a matter of little things. An old connection that no one had bothered to replace. A rag used as a plug because no one had taken the trouble to fix the spring of an oil filler cap. Our men found the problem widespread. Yet they agreed that once diesel owners thought about the problem, they'd see right away what to do about it. They would soon learn to think of every detail of maintenance in terms of the vast volumes of air a modern engine sucks in. As the engine pulls all its air through its connecting hose, the filter rings out the dust, catches it, traps it, and slows down the rush of air. The restriction in the filter lowers the air pressure in the connection. The outside air presses in. If there is a crack, the air passes through it more easily than through the filter. Even a small crack invites dust in. So does a weak joint or a faulty weld. Through the tiniest crack, dust will enter the engine and cause wear. Dust, the enemy of engines, does not always attack in force. Sometimes it is brief, quick, gone in a flash, before anyone has given it a thought. Our men found that our customers should be warned that often dust is almost invisible. 
No matter how clean everything seems to be, chances are that dust is there, even though it can't be seen unless it catches the sun's rays. sunsets. But a handful of these particles will completely ruin any engine. Back at the factory, we engineers talked over a course of action with the executives of our company. At such meetings, we usually discuss complex steps in engine design or production techniques. But when we had talked about the problem of dust a while, it seemed very simple and obvious. We could sum it up, not with charts and equations, but with an hourglass from the kitchen. An engine was like an hourglass that would let pass a handful of dust and no more. A man could slow the passage of dust and save time and distance and money. Or he could let the dust flow quickly and waste all of these things. It was as simple as that. And it was tremendously important that we do something about it right away. When the meeting broke up, the maintenance program we call Operation Hourglass was born. A few weeks later, regular classes of the company's school were taught how to use the kinds of dust-proofing equipment we had helped design. A new method of lengthening engine life was learned by customers and common service representatives from all over the country. An Eastern service manager was the first to be asked by a customer to put Operation Hourglass into action. On every engine the firm bought or rebuilt, they installed the kinds of air induction systems we recommended. With a careful attention to detail, they followed our instructions and did everything they could to keep out dust. They ran the engines on the usual runs to Albany, Cleveland, and New York. They took the same roads and used the same drivers as before. At regular intervals, they checked the air connection by blocking them off at both ends and pumping air into them. If the air under pressure in the connection didn't leak out now, dusty air wouldn't leak in later when the suction of the engine caused a partial vacuum inside the tubing. At first there were no signs that the big red trucks were different from other diesels, but they were pioneers opening a highway to tomorrow. Following the same schedule of overalls as before, the engines were torn down. The liner wear was measured. Formerly, it had averaged seven to fifteen thousandths of an inch. Now it was less than two thousandths of an inch. This meant important savings in replacement and operating costs. And there was only one reason for the difference. The dust had been kept out better. It had been kept out better by the right use of the right equipment and the kind of maintenance we suggest. But today, what the hourglass has meant to one customer is only part of the story. Farther north, there is another hourglass. It is testimony to the fact that another customer has seen his repair costs go down because he asked us to show him how to adopt a program of dust prevention suited to his needs. the West, still another hourglass means that a manufacturer is turning out new models that almost guarantee longer engine life because they reflect a new understanding of the effects of dust. Near a dam in South Dakota, still another hourglass is a symbol of moving earth around the clock without interruption. But the story of Operation Hourglass is not over. 
We've adopted pressurized crankcases, more efficient air cleaners, leak-proof connections, advanced fuel and lubricating oil filters, sealed dipsticks and filler caps to keep dust out of diesels. But you see, Operation Hourglass is more than a design on a drawing board. Operation Hourglass must be understood and put to work in the field. It's up to everyone in the diesel industry, not just the engineers, but every diesel owner and maintenance man, to do the job of holding back the passage of that small amount of dust which alone can wear out an engine. There are still many diesel users who don't believe that a handful of dust is a measure of an engine's life. Operation Hourglass will not be fulfilled until they, too, begin to follow the simple rules of dust prevention. Great strides have been made in making the diesel engine into the powerful giant it is today. But its life still rests on how quickly or how slowly those few ounces of dust pass through it like the grains of sand through an hourglass.